Uh, greetings, everyone. Welcome to the parallel uh, session 5.2 on the impact of COVID-19 in the Southeast Asia. Southeast Asian nations are also hard hit by the COVID-19. Se severe contraction uh, we witness in uh, a lot number of countries in Southeast Asia and increased poverty rate is also witnessed in several countries. We will have three paper presentation today and the first will be on the assessment of the ASEAN uh, wide impact of the COVID-19 on the SDGs. Uh, the paper written by four distinguished researchers, Professor Arif Yusuf, Professor Zusi Anna, Dr. Ahmad Komaru Zaman from Bajajaran University, and Venkata Chalam Ambumozi from the Economic Research Institute of ASEAN in uh, East Asia. Uh, the presentation will follow by a two country uh, paper. Uh, the first one will be a, a paper by uh, Dr. Dang Hai An from the World Bank on the impact of COVID-19 to employment in Vietnam. And the last but not least, of course, uh, the paper present will be uh, uh, presented by Dr. David Reitzer of the Asian Development, uh, Development Bank on the impact of COVID-19 in the Philippines. A bit of housekeeping as we have only 45 minutes for this session. Uh, we will limit a presentation to 8 to 10 minutes to allow some time for discussion. I will notify the speakers when he or she reach the, uh, the 8 minutes and ask to stop when 10 minutes are reach. We will let all three presenters uh, finish the presentation before I open the discussion to all participants in this session. Without further ado, I would like to invite the first presentation, which have already re uh, pre-recorded uh, their presentation. Uh, kindly help Elena uh, to play the, the pre-recorded of Dr. Ahmad Kamarozaman and uh, the co-authors. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Ahmad Komarul Zaman from SDG Center, Universitas Pajajaran, Bandung, Indonesia. In this occasion, I would like to present our latest paper that focus on the impact of COVID-19 crisis on SDGs achievement in ASEAN five countries. This paper is a team effort, including Professor Ansor Yusuf, Professor Susi Anna, both from SDG Center, Universitas Pajajaran, as well as Venta, Venka Tachalam Ambu Mochi from area. So, in this uh, global context, Currently, we are committed in achieving the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. When the SDGs was launched in 2015, many said that SDGs sets two ambitious, expensive, distortive, utopian, and mission impossible targets. And if, see, if we see our situation right now, the achievement of SDGs become more and more challenging as we are hit by a global crisis of COVID-19. Many outdoors found that the current pandemic caused by the biggest humanitarian and health crisis in the century after the Spanish flu pandemic in 1918. In addition to the health crisis, COVID-19 pandemic also created a socio-economic crisis. Coronavirus has disrupted various national, regional, and global development plans. So these plans need to be adjusted or reviewed. Hence, this presentation tries to find out the extent of COVID-19 will interrupt the SDGs achievement of ASEAN 5 countries. This is important as specific analytical research related to the impact of the COVID pandemic on achieving the SDGs target are still limited. Some existing research focus more on impacts on the macroeconomic or qualitative estimation of socioeconomic impacts based on expert views or qualitative research on one or two economic indicators, such as poverty rates and economic growth. On the other hand, among the few, United Nations published a report on the impact of COVID-19 on the SDGs and the global socio-economy. So, every year or even every semester, many prominent organizations come up with GDP growth projection. 
This is also what we see here, the World Bank estimation on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the economy of ASEAN 5 countries. It was estimated that Vietnam would not suffer much from the pandemic. Meanwhile, the rest of the ASEAN 5 countries would suffer more. Philippines was estimated to suffer more than the rest of the ASEAN 5 countries. We see that this projection is very important and hence we use the result of this projection into our analysis. Specifically, we link the projection of income per capita that is measured by GNI per capita and we link this with SDGs indicators. As we can see here in the top graph, we start by collecting valuable information on income projection from reputable organizations such as the World Bank that we showed previously. We utilize the long-term projection that was published on the late 2019 before the pandemic hit, the global, hit globally as without COVID projection, that is the blue dash line. Next, we compile the revised projection that was published on 2020 and we name it as the with COVID projection or it's shown as the green solid line. Given this with and without COVID income projection, we link them with SDGs indicators following this general formula. Yeah. This formula that the projection, we assume that the, projection, the projected achievement of a given SDGs indicator in a country is a function of its latest achievement and the marginal effect of income per capita on SDGs indicator. Once we get the projected SDGs indicator, we then, calcul we, we then calculate the gap that is the difference of SDGs achievement in 2030 between with and without COVID. In addition, we calculate the lag that is the number of years that is needed to reach the without COVID level of achievement in 2030. Then, how do we calculate the marginal effect of GNI per capita on SDGs indicators? This marginal effect is calculated from the regression equation we, we did either from linear, fractional regression, or Tobit regression. So it is chosen after following iterative process. The, the selection of this marginal effect is done in a transparent process and maintaining to maintain the replicability. As we can see here, we start with 1,772 indicators that is taken from the UNSTAD that is go to selection process. And at the end, we, as we said before, we run three regression that is linear, tobit, and fractional regression and choose the one with the minimum RMSE to calculate the elasticity of SDGs indicator to GNI. This is our result. Our analysis found that the COVID-19 crisis interrupted the majority of SDGs indicators. In total, there are more than 90% of the indicators that are slowing down. Vietnam, to be precise, have the least number of SDGs indicators that are interrupted, but still it counts to 60%. Yeah. Then, analyzing by goal shows that the pandemic affected all SDGs goals and on average, SDGs indicators interrupted by 2.27% below the baseline. Specifically for the first goal, no poverty, we can see here that the disruption is quite large in which Philippines suffer most. Next, as we can see here that the disruption caused by COVID-19 pandemic causing a setback of 1.57 years on average. Among others, the setback on goals one is relatively lower than the than on the other goals. Furthermore, we take the advantage of our methodology that allow us to have a more detailed analysis at indicator level. As we can see here, that the SDGs one is composed by both the monetary and non-monetary dimension of poverty, that includes the coverage of social and health protections drinking, water, and sanitation. Some highlights on the analysis among SDGs 1 indicators are as follows. On average, among SN5 countries, the effect on poverty are different over the poverty dimension. Extreme poverty setback between 0 to 2 years and the setback is even larger 
among em employed population. Interestingly, the effect on non-headcount indicators are much worse, <laughs> such as social protection, as well as drinking water and sanitation for the poor. Again, Philippines is the worst affected, while Vietnam is the least. To conclude, our analysis shows that the COVID-19 crisis has interrupted almost all SDGs indicators of ASEAN countries, particularly on SDGs 1. On average, SDGs indicator in 2030 will be around 2.3% lower than the baseline or 1.6 years lag. Vary by indicators, extreme poverty set back by 0 to 2 years, while non headcount indicators is even longer. It also varies across countries. Philippines is the worst affected while Vietnam is the least. Several factors count initial condition, both SDGs and vulnerability to SDGs 19, impact on, uh, of COVID-19 on growth, projected recoveries. Hence, we should uh, focus on the recovery policies and assistance in each in the SDGs indicators should be proportional to the impact. This is uh, the end of our presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ahmad. That's very um, important um, study of the setback of the SDG uh, achievement uh, uh, due to COVID-19. Um, I invite the participants to collect their uh, question and post it in Q&A. But uh, before you can pose your questions to the uh, speakers, let me invite the presentation of Hai Anjang. I would like to present uh, our work on the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemics on the labor market outcomes in Vietnam. And this is a joint work with uh, my colleagues, Zero Kalito, the World Bank, and Kung Nguyen, uh, um, Vietnam National Universities. Uh, as you know, um, uh, last year and also currently in many developing countries around the world, uh, with our full vaccinations, uh, developing countries had to rely on lockdown uh, measures to slow down infection and to prevent uh, that threat uh, caused by the pandemic. And, and all the lockdown measures have a ne negative impact on the labor markets. Uh, and there is a growing body of literature uh, for richer countries. Uh, but uh, currently, there are very, very few studies uh, in the developing country context uh, that analyze large scales and nationally representative data. Um, given the few uh, existing studies, uh, we know that uh, the, the, the pandemic induced lockdowns generally have negative impacts on the labor markets. Uh, for example, a recent uh, multi-country studies uh, looking at 39 countries around the world uh, by Camis et al. Uh, found that 30% of the survey respondents uh, reporting stopping work and 20% of waste workers uh, reporting lack of payment uh, uh, for the work. And uh, women uh, uh, have higher unemployment uh, than men. Uh, uh, that is what a recent study found for India. And another study for South Africa uh, finds that active employment uh, declined by as much as 40% after one month of intensive lockdown. Uh, so we contribute to the literature uh, with new analysis on rich and large scale uh, labor force survey data for Vietnam uh, over, the, over the past few years. And we analyze a wide range of employment, employment indicators. And Vietnam offers an interesting case study. Uh, despite being a low middle income country, uh, Vietnam has been quite successful uh, in fighting uh, the pandemics. Uh, the country implemented a national lockdown for about two weeks in April 2020. And, uh, and Vietnam implemented a very rigorous and strict uh, lockdown measures. For example, for example, banning on commercial fire flights into our into and out of the country and uh, conducting strict quarantines. Um, so by the end of 2020, uh, there are only about 35 
that's our population of almost 100 million people. And uh, we ask a research question, uh, does the lockdown have negative impact on labor market outcomes for Vietnam? And which population groups are more impacted? Uh, which work sectors are more important? And we focus our analysis on uh, the end of 2020, where we have uh, the latest data available. So as a review of the main findings, uh, we found that uh, the pandemic-induced lockdowns uh, increases the unemployment rate and the temporary layoff rate. It decreases the quality of employment, uh, such as wage work, uh, work with a, a former uh, contract uh, with social, social, social insurance. And uh, the lockdown reduces monthly wages by around 10%. Uh, it also increases uh, the set of workers uh, working below the minimum wages by 32%. And the lockdown has stronger effects on informal household workers and FDI sector workers than public sector workers. And the sectors that are most impacted are the transportation and tourism sectors. Um, and uh, we analyze the labor force surveys uh, from 2015 to 2020. And uh, we have about uh, more than 600,000 observations for each year, uh, which allows us to do a uh, detailed uh, disaggregated analysis uh, for the different outcomes as mentioned. Um, and our main um, uh, technique is a, uh, a different and different uh, techniques where basically uh, we compare uh, the impacts of the pandemics in quarter two, quarter three, and quarter four for Vietnam, uh, comparing with quarter one. And uh, we look at the interaction term uh, between the quarters and the COVID years with 2020. Uh, comparing uh, with previous years. So the main reasons are shown in table three, uh, where basically you can see that uh, the pandemics uh, have a positive and very uh, strongly statistically significant impacts on the unemployment rate with column one and the temporary layoff rate in column two. And it has negative impact on the probability of having a wage job or have a job with a formal contract uh, it have a negative impact on monthly wages, and it increases uh, the same workers uh, working uh, below the minimum wage uh, in the last column, in column eight. Uh, we can also disaggregate the estimation, the reasons uh, on a monthly basis. So as you can see, figure three, uh, so that the, the lockdown have a strong impact uh, uh, when we look at uh, when, when, when this, we disagree the data uh, on a monthly basis, and the, the, the effects are strongest uh, for April and May uh, in 2020. Uh, but for uh, wages and uh, the same workers are working below the minimum wage, uh, there is also some evidence that uh, the impacts uh, was stronger uh, in December 2020. Uh, we will need to explore further uh, when data for 2021 uh, become available. Uh, so our reasons are robust to various uh, sensitivity analysis that we did, including using uh, you know different model with different uh, provincial fixed effect in, instead of uh, district fixed effect. Uh, we also conducted uh, uh, various placebo tests uh, where we compare uh, you know when we exclude the 2020 labor force survey and uh, we just look at uh, you know any uh, other preceding years. And we also implemented uh, heterogeneity het hetero analysis by geographical reasons, educational level, and work sectors. Um, but uh, perhaps uh, most interestingly and most worrisomely, uh, we found that the lockdowns have a strong impact on the most vulnerable workers, uh, th that is, so. Uh, with lower wages and the working uh, below the minimum wages. So in figure seven, you can see that uh, the worker working uh, below the minimum wages, they are strongly uh, impacted. And uh, if you look at the bottom graph, you, uh, about the bottom of the graph, you can see that uh, the poorest worker, uh, worker though in quintile Y, quintile one, the poorest quintiles, uh, they are more uh, affected compared to workers uh, in the other quintiles. Um, so it can be, uh, it can raise some 
uh, cause for concerns uh, about rising wage inequality uh, for Vietnam. And we also uh, look at the data for the whole country and we found that uh, the lockdown uh, did, in, did increase uh, wage in inequality, uh, you know, for the whole data set. Yes. So uh, to, to conclude, uh, we offer an early studies on the impact of the pandemic and lockdowns on, un, on employment outcomes for Vietnam, a poorer country. And we analyze a wide range of empl employment indicators uh, from several rounds of Vietnam labor force surveys, uh, which are not available in the existing studies. Uh, we find that the lockdowns uh, increases the unemployment rate and the temporary layoff rate. It decreases the quality of employment uh, by around 10% and it increases the same workers are uh, working below the minimum wages uh, by as much as 32%. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, hi, Anda. Uh, just one moment so that I, I share this with the microphone. Okay. Um, so I would like to uh, basically uh, begin by saying that um, this, uh, presentation was motivated by the context of, of the Philippines, uh, the, the country where uh, we as ADB uh, employees are, are based for our headquarters. Um, it's, it's a country that has, uh, as mentioned in the first presentation, been hit particularly hard uh, by COVID-19 and COVID-19 uh, responses. It's a, it's a country where there's been a lot of progress historically on equity, particularly uh, gender equity. Um, and uh, the, the question is to see how the very strong COVID control policies that have been put into place in the Philippines uh, has, has affected that, that progress. Uh, the Philippines, uh, both has, um, in 2020, was one of the most affected countries in terms of COVID burden, uh, but also was uh, among the countries in the world uh, with the most stringent lockdowns for the most protracted period. And schools have remained completely closed uh, nationally in the Philippines since the beginning of the pandemic. Since March 2020, there has not been a day in a classroom for any uh, students in the public school system. So it's, it's a country where there have been very uh, sharp responses to COVID. There were extensive lockdown measures for much of 2020, uh, very strong restrictions on, on businesses, employment, and mobility. And, and so the question is, how does that affect uh, the progress the country has made? Uh, what we took as an approach uh, is a simulation approach. Uh, we didn't have uh, high quality enough uh, recent data uh, to be able to do an empirical approach as we saw for Vietnam. Uh, so instead we, we, we took a, a somewhat unique uh, kind of simulation approach uh, where we tried to really look at what sectors are uh, affected by uh, the different policies in place, as well as precautionary behavior by consumers, and how does that affect uh, demand for, for, for labor, and how does that filter in uh, to, to income, and how does that affect poverty? Um, so for, for the demand side, uh, we want to capture the effects of precautionary uh, behavior by consumers. Um, so what we did is, is we used uh, some existing est expert opinion-based estimates of effects on demand by sector of a global respiratory disease pandemic that had been prepared actually for the US government. Uh, and we mapped out the sectors of uh, the Philippine economic structure to those of uh, the, the analysis in which they reported by individual quite detailed sector, what the expected effects would be on uh, consumer behavior uh, from the presence of the pandemic and uh, behaviors being more cautious. Uh, behavior becoming more cautious. We then uh, used a production function approach uh, to translate these changes in demand uh, for output from each of these uh, subsectors in each region of the Philippines into uh, a change for in labor demand. So that is to capture just the inherent response to a pandemic, how consumers behave, how that changes demand for output from particular sectors of the economy, how that changes then demand for labor. Uh, then we wanted to bring in the effects of lockdown measures, restrictions on workers being able to work in particular sectors of the Philippines. Uh, in, in the Philippines, uh, there have been a series of different lockdown intensities. Under each of these intensities, 
Uh, specific restrictions have been announced on the share of workers who can work on site. Uh, and this has been done by region per lockdown period by uh, sector mapping out to the Philippine statistical systems, uh, two digit sectors of the economy. So we could use this as basically a shock uh, to uh, the labor supply that can go into a production function. Um, and so from that, we could get uh, effects on, on value added. Uh, and we also have the direct effect, of course, on whether labor uh, can go into um, value added and producing, the, and producing output. Um, so we did this for each lockdown period in each region um, and each uh, subsector. And we also assumed that some work from home activity could continue, but it would be somewhat limited uh, due to uh, uh, feasibility and, and uh, of having work from home. We brought it together by trying to take either the larger uh, decline of either the supply or the demand shock, which may be an underestimate. In many cases, they could be additive effects, but we consider them as substitutive to be uh, conservative. Um, and then we, we translated this basically into income effects, um, also considering uh, own account income versus whether uh, workers are employees in each sector uh, in each region. Uh, then we, uh, by getting an income effect, we could recompute household income uh, using the income and expenditure survey microdata, and then we could get a new profile. Um, and basically this is analysis that's based on which sectors are restricted, which geographies are restricted. It does not, it has a number of limitations. It doesn't capture whether individuals themselves would be the most likely to get fired in a sector. Uh, it's really based on the, the sort of bias of which sectors are restricted and which regions are restricted uh, by policy. Um, and uh, we, we don't try to capture the effects of uh, fiscal support. Um, and we do recognize, of course, the demand reductions by sector are drawn from a USA context, but uh, we're adapting that to the structure of the Philippine economy. Uh, we find a value added reduction of 13.5% versus uh, a baseline, uh, slightly less than the actual decline compared to projections, which was 15.5%, but we think it's very plausible and it makes sense we're emitting some channels of effects, such as through remittances. Um, we uh, find a greater reduction in labor demand than the, the decline in GDP and value added. We find uh, a higher uh, degree of household income loss than the reduction in labor demand. And we find that most effect, both effects uh, actually affect women more than men due to the nature of which sectors uh, have been impacted and which geographies have been impacted. Um, we we uh, also find, uh, interestingly, as a shock that there are higher effects on urban poverty than rural poverty. Uh, we find higher effects on female than male headed households. Uh, that effect is particularly in rural areas. Um, and then we find that also there were big shocks that would have happened even without containment policies, uh, but containment policies have uh, made the shocks much, much bigger. Uh, and they've also amplified the, the gender disparity in terms of the, the effects of having the COVID uh, pandemic. So uh, overall, uh, what we find uh, are really uh, severe poverty and gender uh, implications of COVID-19 and COVID-19 responses. Uh, we find uh, that uh, the policy responses have really amplified implications for, for poverty and, and for, for, uh, for female workers, female-headed households. Uh, these uh, results I shared right here, uh, they emit many other important channels uh, and so they're, they're under estimates. They don't capture the full set of, of, of effects. Um, an incredibly important set of effects occurs via uh, school closure and human capital and the future uh, productive capacity of the country that we're not trying to capture. These are only losses in 2020 that I presented. Um, and uh, we would expect the, these, uh, for example, school closure effects, they would also very much uh, affect the poorest households the most as they have the least ability to cope with uh, the kind of distance education arrangements that exist. Uh, to end these kinds of costs, of course, rapid uh, vaccination uh, becomes incredibly important. Uh, until that rapid, widespread vaccination can occur, um, we also find that in other analysis, uh, there are ways to avoid these kinds of costs um, that can help reduce transmission 
uh, much more cost effectively uh, compared to uh, broad restrictions and lockdown measures. And uh, they think that better help to preserve uh, progress on, on uh, gender equity and on poverty. Um, Two more so, minutes, David. Uh, yeah, I actually, uh, I did it in eight, so I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, David. Uh, excellent presentation of these three papers. I think I would like to invite um, if there is any questions from the uh, participants today. I found the three papers are interlinked together. The first one uh, evaluate um, across uh, ASEAN or Southeast Asia uh, countries uh, effect of the COVID-19 on all the um, variables or all indicators of the SDGs where the poverty is among the highest um, um, uh, what is it um, a de decline or setback as Ahmad already mentioned and we see from Ahmad's presentation is the Vietnam is the upper extreme and Philippines is the uh, lowest extreme of the impact and uh, Hai An already uh, presented uh, the the more closer look on the labor market effect of the COVID-19 in Vietnam and David already elab elaborated on the uh, poverty and gender impact uh, particularly uh, on of COVID-19 in Philippines where uh, of course, um, uh, higher poverty rate and uh, female especially uh, hit harder of the COVID-19. And uh, also I think you mentioned the urban area, right, uh, David? Yeah. So uh, with that, while we are waiting for the questions from the, from the audience, I'd like to pose a questions or comments to Ahmad. With the impact uh, and the gap that the uh, COVID-19 bring about to the SDGs indicators, Ahmad, what would you recommend to those countries or Southeast Asian countries to um, reduce the gap? And for Hai An, I would like to know how your assessment on the sectoral impact of the COVID-19 on the labor market how you see uh, the differences uh, in effect uh, across sectors uh, in Vietnam. Um, and for, um, for David, I would like to know um, whether, uh, can you elaborate more on the, um, the, the interventions that the government uh, provided, does it ad address the most hit segments of the population or the economy? So those three, uh, thank you so much for the excellent presentation. Can I invite Ahmad first and hi An and then De David. Okay, thank you very much, Ibu uh, Titiana. So about the... Uh, Policy recommendation uh, in this paper we didn't specify very uh, yeah, detail about uh, how to uh, to formulate. Sorry, the... uh, hello. Can you hear? Hello, me? hello. Yeah. Hello. Can you hello? hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. But hello. Yes, we can hear Ahmad. Okay. Yes. Ahmad. Okay. Do yeah. You want okay. to respond? And we yeah. also have one uh, question from Andy uh, in the chat room. How do each of the panelists see the next five years for poverty trends level with or without 100% vaccination level? Assuming reasonable efficacy, no new variants that avoid vaccination, and presumably annual vaccination programs. So that's okay, yeah. all. Okay. Please, uh, the screen are yours. Okay, thank you. So, uh, regarding the policy recommendation uh, in Ahmad, this paper, we didn't. Are you can you respond first? Yeah, I, I I respond here. Hello, can you hear me? 
Hello? Okay, yeah. yes, we can hear uh, you. Thank you. Okay, I, I, I'll, I'll move forward. So, uh, but uh, if we think that uh, we should focus on the... Elina, can you hear Ahmad? Yes, I can hear him. <laughs> okay, I think that there are some connection problem here. So regarding the, the, the policy, I think uh, we should focus on the uh, recovery and uh, policy. And then assistance should be proportionally to uh, delivered to the to its indicators that has uh, different impact on 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 the uh, from the COVID nineteen. But the to be precise, uh, uh, honestly, we didn't uh, formulate any uh, any specific uh, policy uh, measures here in this paper. So it's on only a gen general idea that because we we analyze. Uh, almost all of the SDGs indicators from all the countries and then uh, hence we we didn't focus on the uh, specific policy recommendation regarding the uh, question from uh, Andy Sumner uh, in the next five years for the poverty trends oh, with and without 100% vaccination level I think uh, with the vaccination level uh, with 100% vaccination level I think the the uh based on our i mean if we see from our uh, analysis yeah even though it, it, it didn't say about uh, something about the vaccination but i think uh the vaccination could uh what is the name could fasten the 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 uh the crisis yeah to be end to be ended so the people can go out again yeah can do the the new normal things yeah hence the the economy can uh, roll uh, faster than than currently uh, that that is happening currently and then uh, at the end i think the poverty could be uh, lower yeah than the the current position thank you Hi. Um, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for Titik uh, for your questions. So, um, so I would like to share our screen uh, to show the impacts of the lockdowns on the different uh, sectors. Uh, I didn't show this one yet uh, because then uh, given you know the scope of uh, yes of time. But but here uh, let me show this one. Um, Okay. Yes. So yes. So if you see this one, then uh, basically, as you can see, um, we uh, we look uh, we did uh, disaggregate uh, the estimation results for the different uh, sectors, and uh, you can see from the top of the graph uh, that the workers working in the foreign direct investment sector or in the private sector or in the informal, you know, like a household sectors, uh, they are more strongly affected uh, compared to workers in the public sectors. Yes, so we did see some uh, impacts by the different sectors. And, um, and also interestingly, uh, if you look at the bottom of the graph, then you can see that uh, there are some uh, other sectors, for example, transportation, uh, hotel and restaurants, uh, that are more of a affected uh, by the lockdown, uh, and and the reasons uh, I believe you know are also quite consistent uh, what we with what we usually uh, see in the media, right? I mean about airline industry or you know the tourism industry, you know like uh, uh, suffering you know uh, more losses uh, because of the pandemic uh, lockdown measures uh, in Vietnam and also elsewhere for other different countries. Um, so um and then uh, very briefly i would like to uh answer any some questions uh so so in my opinion um uh, you know given the context of vietnam uh Again, Vietnam can offer quite interesting guide to respond to that question from Andy. Uh, from Andy, uh, because uh, as you know, you know, like in uh, 2020, uh, Vietnam has got a lot of, uh, you know, like. Uh, 
praise or congratulations, you know, like uh, in the local media and from around the world uh, for the country uh, uh, non-pharmaceutical, you know, intervention, uh, basically, you know, using lockdown measures, uh, strict quarantines and so on, and social distancing uh, to fight against the pandemic. Uh, but now coming to the to April and uh, May in 2021, this year, then uh, given, you know, given the uh, uh, the event of the new Delta variant, uh, then, you know, all the non-pharmaceutical, you know, interventions uh, turn out, I mean, not to be as effect effective as last year. So, so currently, you know, at the, at the moment that we are, that I'm talking right now, uh, a few, you know, like uh, most of the major cities in Vietnam are uh, under lockdown again uh, because of, you know, because of the uh, new Delta variant. So, so indeed, and also at the same time, uh, the vaccination rate for Vietnam is still uh, pretty low, you know, compared to other countries uh, in the region. So, so definitely, I think that, you know, vaccination is a very important uh, for the country. Uh, but not only vaccination, but also vaccination in combination uh, with all the traditional, you know, non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions, you know, uh, can, you know, can uh, hopefully uh, can uh, have the country uh, recover, you know, from, from the pandemic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, David. Um, okay, uh, uh, thank you for, for some excellent questions um, and, and some quite complex questions. Uh, so I, I would say uh, the, the government, in terms of reducing the, the cost of these measures, offsetting uh, the effects, um, they have uh, they've done some measures that are, are good in terms of allowing restrictions to become more specific than they were in 2020. Um, one of the, the important things that was there there, ha there has been an expansion to some of the paid sick leave uh, policy coverages, so that that allows you to target who you're paying to stay home or who you want to stay home and compensate them, provide appropriate incentives. Uh, there was a large uh, SAP policy of providing cash transfers uh, during the hardest period of lockdown. Um, the, the challenge with that is that there wasn't very tight targeting. Uh, so the, the share of the population that was eligible for the transfer uh, was a very, very large share rather than targeting those who are most uh, adversely affected. Um, and the problem also is then the breadth of that kind of uh, transfer almost become, makes it, it becomes an impediment to having hard lockdown when it's needed uh, because the hardest lockdown is now associated with that payment, which then is expected to be provided to such a broad uh, swath of the, the population rather than targeting it so that it can be brought in uh, more selectively and, and also create the right incentives for the policies to work well. Um, so, it, and in, in terms of the largest long-term cost, which is not quantified here, it, the largest cost of the long-term will be the school closure policy. Uh, and uh, the school closure policy um, has, there are many areas of the Philippines uh, where the, the cases are very, very low. Uh, schools continue to be closed. There's some discussion, again, possibly of piloting some reopening for lower grades, but this is um, long, long overdue. Um, so uh, there, there, there's been improvement over time. Uh, restrictions have become more targeted and selective. Um, some of the other non-pharmaceutical interventions are more cost-effective, have been used more, um, but there, there also is still a reliance on, on a lot of these very costly restrictions. Um, in terms of uh, poverty, if we look going forward, uh, you know, I think the, the, the question itself actually sort of specifies the answer in a way. Uh, a, a lot really depends on what happens with the future of the pandemic, uh, whether uh, vaccination rates can continue to accelerate, uh, whether uh, vaccines, whether immunity is waning over time, uh, and whether we have new variants, because we will have new variants. Um, if we uh, Take, if we assume that there is no waning of immunity, but the evidence is immunity does wane, uh, if we uh, assume that would be uh, not an issue, um, basically in the case of the Philippines, uh, Metro Manila will reach 70% of adults having uh, being vaccinated probably by the middle of October, uh, but the rest of the country is far, far behind. 
Um, and the, the rest of the country would take well into the middle of next year, probably to reach 70% of adults. And then there's a huge child population, uh, which also has not yet been vaccinated. And if you actually wanted to bring the epidemic under control in terms of transmission, uh, th they would also need to be vaccinated. Um, so the, the you know whole epidemic wouldn't be under sort of full control until the end of next year, probably. Um, in the meantime, growth will be uh, slow. Um, certain pockets may be able to grow more. Um, and, uh, and, and if we look at poverty and, and the kinds of numbers we have, that would put us back about five years uh, in terms of uh, growth, in, ter in terms of reducing poverty. Um, and, and so uh, to get back to the, that level in five years would need the same level of growth as happened over the past five years up to uh, the, the pandemic. Um, you know, whether that's possible in the near term is, is, is a question given that it will be this uh, continued situation of some, some COVID. So uh, it, it may be more than another five years to get back uh, to the sort of pre-COVID uh, levels. And then that's not taking into account the long-term effect of school closure and how that affects uh, the future productivity of the country, um, the ability of students to th this massive young share of the population to effectively enter the workforce and become productive. Uh, so that may also diminish the growth potential as well. So uh, it could be quite long. Yeah, I think that ends our uh, session. Uh, we overrun by two minutes. Uh, let me thank the, the, the all the distinguished uh, speakers for the excellent papers and see you in the uh, uh, next uh, session. Bye for now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elena, for the help. Yeah. Thank you, Tite. Thank you, Elena, David, and Amma, and everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.